Thank you guys so much. I'm so excited to be here in Amsterdam um, with all of you. Uh, so real talk, my talk is about 35 minutes and I'm going to try and jam it into 20. So we'll see how it goes. I might end up speaking auctioneer style. So hopefully you all can keep up. So before I um, start my talk today about courageous creativity, I want to open this imaginary door right here and invite you all into my office. And I call my office the Peach Pit on account of the peach-colored walls, the kind of cozy womb-like vibe, and also um, the fact that I'm a child of the 90s and I love this show called 90210. I don't know if you guys had that here, but the Peach Pit was a key feature. And about once a month, I have a bunch of different people come into the Peach Pit, and anyone can sign up from any part of the company, no matter what their role. And we sit in there, we brainstorm, we come up with new ideas, we talk about challenges, we help each other um, problem solve. And you know, we have everyone from editorial to engineering coming through. And a couple key features of the Peach Pit are um, rosé, peach-flavored candies, and this crystal-covered uh, buzzer. Um, which was lovingly hand bedazzled. And this, this buzzer is sort of our nothing is impossible buzzer. So in the Peach Pit, we want ideas to be free to come out. We want people to feel unrestrained to express themselves. So this buzzer, if you mention budget, you get buzzed. If you mention traffic, you get buzzed. And that's not because there aren't real constraints to the things that we're creating every day. It's just that in this environment with people um, of all different you know, departments and, and backgrounds, we want people to feel that they're in a safe space to express themselves. And I start every Peach Pit out the same way, and I'm going to ask you guys to join me in this exercise. And it's going to be really difficult because you're packed in like sardines. And I know some of you are sitting at tables and you have laptops on your laps. So, but if you're able to, I'm going to ask you to get up. Um, and we're going to do this improv warm up. Um, so here's how it works. And if you can't, um, if you're not able to get up, um, and if you're not, you know, able to move around, you can just, you know, use your voice or use your mind and your imagination. Um, so here's how it works. We're going to start with the right leg, then the right arm, left leg, left arm, and counting down from four, three, two, one, three, two, one, two, one, 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 one. And just follow along. If you mess up, that's fine. I almost always mess up. It's not about perfection. It's just about getting our yayas out. OK, are you guys ready? OK, let's do this. OK. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. Four, three, two, one. You guys have to say the numbers, too. Four, three, two, one. 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 Two, one. Two, one. Two, one. Two, one. One, 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 one. Woo! Yeah. OK, you feel alive? <laughs> OK, so why do we shake in the peach pit? We shake it out because play creates trust, because it levels the playing field. I'm just as ridiculous as you are. You're just as ridiculous as I am. So let's just leave those inhibitions at the door. And we play to get, we shake to get out of our heads and into our bodies. I don't know, you know what meeting people are coming out of, and I want them to feel present in the room. So I brought you into the Peach Pit to start our conversation today because for me it embodies three key tenets of courageous creativity. The first is be the most you. When you leverage your unique personality, you can turn a boring brainstorm into a Peach Pit. The second is create the conditions for creativity. Creativity can be so elusive, so it's important to know how to nurture it both in yourself and in other people. And the third, friction creates sparks. When you have people from all different teams brainstorming together in a room, the ideas rub against each other in a way that creates sparks. So now that we've shaken it out together, I um, want to introduce myself. So hi, I'm Piera. And I grew up in a tiny town in Maine, in the northern part of the United States. And this, is a, this was my town square. So as you can imagine, it was pretty hopping on a Friday night. Um, I grew up with uh, an entrepreneur dad. We would brainstorm business ideas around the kitchen table at night. 
um, and a social worker, feminist mom who read us feminist fairy tales at bedtime. And the uh, apple didn't fall far from the tree. Here's me and my brother. Um, the whole family, we love costumes and dressing up. And as a teenager, you know, growing up in this tiny town, um, I, my window into another world was this teen magazine called Sassy, which was um, a feminist teen magazine that taught me that weird was cool and that gave me this window into amazing women in New York creating content that celebrated kind of women in all their fullness. And this is me um, at junior prom with my girl gang. Um, that was kind of my favorite outfit at the time, a blue wig, blue sequin dress, and white go-go boots. I might still wear that. Um, and then when I graduated high school, I knew I had to move to the birthplace of Sassy, New York City. And so I picked up and moved to New York. And I was just so um, in awe of the city and just being surrounded by so much incredible and diverse culture. Um, and that, you know, that just was something that totally inspired me and made me realize I had made absolutely the right choice. And it was that culture of New York that first inspired me and my three co-founders who are there, Philip, Justin, and Christine, to start Refinery29. And we actually started Refinery29 um, as this mall map um, where we had 29 stores, um, and these were all stores that really kind of had their own unique community around them that really sort of saw style as something that was truly personal and really meaningful. And this was like the map that we started Refinery29 as. And it's kind of funny because sometimes people ask me, you know, did you know Refinery29 would be this, you know, global company? And the answer is absolutely not. You know, we called it Refinery29. We started with this map of 29 stores, and it was really, you know, what we made of it that, um, that brought it to life. And when we started, the media, women's media landscape looked something like this. Um, a lot of articles about how to please your man, how to get beach body ready, how to, you know, slim down, and, you know, really painting this very narrow window of what beauty looked like. Um, and, and really sort of selling this false aspiration to women that wasn't empowering, that wasn't celebrating, you know, what I was raised to aspire to. I was raised, you know, raised to aspire to be the most badass version of myself, to continue to grow and, and take on new challenges and be the most me. And this was so the antithesis of that. And so when we, you know, as we grew Refinery29, we wanted to create for a new generation of women. We wanted to create for a generation of women and truly celebrate them in all of their incredible complexity and strength. And um, here's a taste of the women that we create content for. Is it possible? It feels a little bit stronger up here, kind of a, like a head crosswind. It, it's a little bit gusty, so maybe I'll be able to get a lull so we can get this off. There's a, a bit of a crosswind over here. Oh my God, thank you it's so windy much. where you're at, obviously. You don't need to jump. Definitely your call. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so 
So our mission at Refinery is to be a catalyst for women to feel, see, and claim their power, and we want to celebrate them every single day. So being the most you, as much as it is about you know, leaning into your strengths and really knowing who you are, uh, there are also moments where who you think you are gets challenged. And I had a moment like that as we were starting to scale the company, and I felt really comfortable in my role as a creative director, as a creative person, but I, um, as the company grew and I started to have to move into a lot of unfamiliar territory as an executive, I felt really uncomfortable, and I started to question if I was still the right person for my job. Um, and there was a moment where I really thought, you know, maybe I've maxed out and I'm not going to be able to, to do this anymore as we started to manage, you know, big teams and starting to really think about business strategy and, you know, doing a lot of negotiation, heading into these uncomfortable areas. Um, but what really unlocked that for me was when I learned to negotiate. So, you know, before, beforehand, I thought that negotiation kind of went something like this, you know, you pick up the phone, fuck you, it's my way or the highway, you hang up the phone. And of course, that's a gross exaggeration of, of you know, what negotiation is sort of looks like in the, you know, in the picture of the world. But um, I did think you had to be super uncompromising. And it was when I learned to negotiate in my own style and I started to experiment with that that I really unlocked... Um, you know, a new way of doing something and seeing that I could bring a lot of my own unique personality traits into my leadership in all areas. Um, so what I learned is that if it doesn't fit, tailor it to fit you better. You know, when I started bringing imagination and collaboration and creativity into my negotiation, all of a sudden I started outperforming my goals, but also feeling so much more comfortable in my own skin. And sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need to bring in, you know, the, the things that make you comfortable, the things that you are really good at into new areas so that you can grow in new ways. So being the most you is really all about sticking, staying true to your values as you grow your business or you grow in your career or you just grow in your life. Trusting your intuition, knowing that your gut can guide you, that you know, sometimes it's just about making a decision, starting something, and then continuing to mold it. If it doesn't fit, tailor it to fit you better. You can bring your strengths into areas that are more uncomfortable to you in order to grow. And remember that you're never done growing. You know, you might think that you've maxed out. You might think you can't do something. But I, uh, trust me, you, you can. So a few months ago, one of our creative directors came into my office. And she wanted to talk about a project that she was working on. So we sat down, and she briefed me on the project. And... Um, you know, I started coming up with ideas and I was just, you know, shooting off all these ideas. We could do this, we could do that. Like, you know, it was just sort of on fire, having like lots of thoughts. And um, I looked over to her and I thought she was going to be really elated because I was being so helpful. Um, but when I turned to her, she looked completely downtrodden. And I said, whoa, Stella, what's going on? Are you, you know, are you okay? And she said, well, you know, you have all these ideas, and that's really great. But when I had to brainstorm this a couple hours ago, I didn't have any ideas. And sometimes I wonder if I'm creative enough for this job. Oh, I felt for her so hard in that moment. I mean, ha has anyone here had a moment where you fell short of your own expectations, you doubted yourself, and you thought that you just weren't worthy? I know I've had that many, many times. So I turned to her and I said, Stella, what were the conditions for the brainstorm that you were having? You know, what was going on when you had to have your brainstorm? And she said, oh, well, our West Coast salesperson called me up. They said, I need these ideas for the client by end of day. What do you got? I said, oh, that's interesting. So basically someone put a gun to your head, said, dance, monkey, dance, and you ran out of dance moves. Um, you know, and then I r reminded her, I said, you know, it's so important when you're brainstorming, especially in a pinch when you have a deadline, um, to, to create the conditions for creativity. And for me, that means, you know, surrounding myself with images that get my mind going, that bring up new ideas. For me, it means opening up, you know, a magazine or a thesaurus and doing wordplay. 
But mostly for me, it means bringing people into the room that I can trust, that I feel comfortable around, and who kind of open my mind to ideas. And I turned to Stella and I said, you're one of those people. I consistently bring you into brainstorms. So it's no wonder that I'm coming up with all these ideas, but when you had your brainstorm, you fell short. And I think that's such an important thing to remember. So often we can focus on that moment of deficit and get stuck in it and think you know, that we're not capable. But what if the opposite is true and said? What if we trace back the path to when we are just overflowing with ideas, when we totally rock it out, and figure out what was going on when that happened, and try and recreate that for ourselves over and over again? Because creativity, it really is so elusive. And so anything that you can do to kind of game the system and help yourself to um, you know, put yourself in a good place to create is so important. So my first job um, out of college was at this magazine called City. And I started to see this pattern emerge over and over again in our brainstorms. That was one of the early conditions for creativity for me. So what would happen was that someone would, we would have these brainstorms. Someone, we felt, you know, everyone was like very free and open with each other. So someone would say something really ridiculous. Everyone would laugh. And then the next thing, the follow on would be the most brilliant thing. And I think anyone that was watching us like a fly on the wall would have thought that we were just fucking around wasting time. Um, but truly, they were some of the most productive brainstorms. And I think you know, creating the environment where um, you can be humorous, you can let yourself be open, really unleashes amazing ideas. And this is the kind of thing that we would be brainstorming. This was a shoot that we did uh, with balloon people modeling the season's hottest accessories. Um, the conditions for creativity aren't always sunny. Um, so one day that was really dark for me and many other people was the day after the election in the US. Um, I woke up, I felt so heavy. I wanted to put on black and crawl into a hole and never interface with society ever again. Um, lots of dramatic thoughts. Uh, but I knew, you know, one place that I derive a lot of courage from is my role as a leader. And I knew that on that day, more than many other days, I was needed and I needed to go into the office and work with the energy that was there and help people to turn pain into purpose. And so I went in and we did this, you know, we set up a brainstorm for people that wanted to talk about the issues, that wanted to talk about how they were feeling, and we talked about how we could move forward. And, you know, a lot of things came out of that day, but one of the things that came out was that we decided to work with 30 different artists for the Women's March. And, um, well, the Women's March wasn't announced yet, but it sort of led to that. We talked about the power of art to heal, the power of art as a catalyst for conversation. And so we worked with these 30 artists artists to um, create artwork about the issues that mattered to them. And that artwork was picked up all over the place. The Women's March used it. Um, Hillary Clinton tweeted it. We saw people marching with our signs everywhere from Paris to Kosovo to Park City, Utah to New York City. Um, and we were on the cover of the New York Times with the artwork that we created. And I think it's so important to remember that sometimes, um, sometimes you need to embrace the uncomfortable and walk into it because when you embrace the uncomfortable, when you go bravely into the unknown and have tough conversations, you can tap into something so much deeper than yourself. You can tap, tap into the zeitgeist. So creating the conditions for creativity is really all about knowing what works for you, recreating those things over and over again. Um, the idea that laughter unlocks brilliance and it's also good for your health, so trying to bring it into brainstorms is really important. Um, do it for someone else. Sometimes when you think about you know, creating for your audience or um, you know, creating for someone else, it can help you to open up a new way of thinking and, and kind of get out of your head and embrace the uncomfortable. So friction creates sparks. Another moment of friction as we scaled our business was um, you know, a, a friction that I think a lot of businesses have, which is that we were starting to you know, scale up, producing a ton of content, and we also you know, we were having this friction of trying to balance quality and quantity, trying to balance you know, m meaningful, purposeful content with you know, being able to move quickly. And there was this moment where all of a sudden people were saying that creative is a bottleneck. 
and our editors needed to write stories quickly, so they started pulling from all of these you know, stock photography sites. But what was happening was that the site looked something like this. You know, it didn't reflect the diversity that we wanted to have in our content. It didn't reflect um, you know, the creativity and the focus on individuality that's so important to Refinery29 as a brand. Um, and I got really frustrated. I, again, had this moment where I was just like, you know, felt misunderstood and felt like we were, you know, we were in this stuck place. But sometimes, you know, using your imagination to combat frustration um, is a really fantastic tool. And so what we ended up doing was we ended up shooting our own stock photography. So um, we said, you know what? If we need to move fast and we want to be representing, you know, diversity of all kinds in our content, and that doesn't exist in the stock photography world, we're going to create our own stock photography. So, um, you know, before, after. So, you know, making sure that we were really um, using models that were embodying their their own selves and. Um, and this project actually grew to be something that's bigger than us. So we, we transformed our own site using the stock archive to a point where 75% of our 529 users say they can recognize one of our images in a lineup. Um, and we expanded that to a project with Getty called the No Apologies Collection. We called it that because we don't think women should have to apologize for who they are or what they look like. Um, and now p anyone can use these images in their own content, um, their own advertisements, because we want to change the representation of women, not just on our own site and platforms, but across the industry. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, friction creates sparks. It's all about combating frustration with imagination, reframing the problem to unlock the solution. And you can do it. I've had so many moments where I have thought, I can't do this, I can't do this, I'm going to have to quit, I can't do this. And you know what? I've done it, I'm doing it, I'm up here doing it right now. So, you guys want to do something dorky with me? Huh? Okay, I'm gonna say you can do it, and you're gonna say I can do it. Ready? You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Yeah, damn straight. You guys got this. Okay. Um, okay, time is up. Slowly finish the talk. I will do that. Um, okay, so I brought you in. <laughs> I brought you guys in in the Peach Pit, which is one of my favorite spots, and I'm going to take you out on in Refinery 29's 29 Rooms, which is another favorite space that um, I've created. So 29 Rooms was an event that we made for our 10-year anniversary. We said we want to take our digitally native brand and create an event in IRL um, that's a gift to our audience. So we. Um, we started the project by being the most us. We thought about the tenets of Refinery29, the key values um, of inclusivity, um, creativity, imagination, um, and we thought about all the different topics that we covered in our content. Um, we then started to sort of brainstorm around how could we bring our, you know, our brand to life in this really immersive, amazing way. And um, one of the things that inspired us was we sort of, in, in thinking about what was the most us, we tracked back to our history and we remembered that original mall map of 29 different stores. And we said, what if we created a space with 29 different rooms where each room represented a different aspect of our brand? So we got really excited about this idea. We um, started to create a mood board of you know, amazing installation artwork and, and museum pieces. and um, then we, then we took that and we brought it to our executive team. And as you can imagine what came next, friction. Um, wouldn't be a conclusion if I wasn't hitting my key points. So friction creates sparks. We uh, brought it to the executive team. They said, that's amazing. It looks really cool, but you know, that looks expensive. How are we going to monetize it? That's amazing. It looks really cool, but it looks like MoMA. It looks like a museum. How are we going to bring that level of artistic credibility? And they said, that's amazing, but we're a digital brand. How are we going to get thousands of people to a space in real life during New York Fashion Week? 
But because I know friction creates sparks, I was not discouraged. I said, great feedback. We'll get back to you. Um, and so we, got, we kind of went back with that feedback and we worked, workshopped it, came up with solutions, went back to them and got a green light. And we created 29 Rooms, which was a viral sensation of an event. We reached one in two people on Instagram with this event last year. Um, we're in our third year of the event this year and it's our most commercially successful um, event that we've ever made. Um, but the thing that I think is the most gratifying about 29 Rooms, um, here's all the incredible user-generated content, not all, just a color-coordinated window into the UGC. Um, but to me, the thing that was the most gratifying about creating 29 Rooms was that the audience feedback. People said, after going through this experience, I realized it was time for me to start dreaming bigger. People said, 29 Rooms made me feel creative. And someone said, this past weekend, you helped thousands of people get lost, even if for just an hour, in the hope and positivity of creative expression. And that's the thing about courageous creativity. When you are courageously creative, it creates more courageous creativity in the world. Courageous creativity is contagious. So you are courageous, you are creative. Now go out there and spread that shit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.